Swansea, my hometown, ought to be totally unrecognizable. To me, it had a blitz. These streets have all been straightened up and replanned. But in my day, it was a, a lovely, warm, friendly, unplanned chaos of a place. In fact, the only straight street uh, I remember was this one, Walters Road. And this is where all the more fashionable people lived in those days. It's a, a lovely tree-lined avenue. But turn off the main road, and immediately you're in another world. Culvert Terrace, the road I was born in, at number nine. Mr. Gethin, the solicitor, has it today. To my eyes now, it seems so much smaller than I remember. We, we used to play football in that garden. How on earth could we have done it? But from here, my two brothers and I used to set off to climb the steep hillside that led up to our school. And we tramped up these slopes. They seemed like Alps to me at the age of six, but we did it twice a day. Once for morning school, and then back after lunch. Round the corner, and there was Terrace Road School. It seemed to be carved out of the hillside like the rock temples of Abu Simnel. Frankly, I can't remember much of what I'd learnt at school, but one thing was driven firmly into my mind by climbing up the hills to it. Swansea was a town ruled by the sea. And how well I remember in the days when school seemed endless and the schoolyard like a prison, looking out beyond and then far away over the rooftops, a lighthouse on a white rock with a queer name, the Mumbles. Going to the Mumbles used to be the great Saturday treat. On the old Mumbles train, a tank engine belching smoke and cinders, pulling a collection of old tram cars. It was, in fact, the oldest working railway line in Britain, and looked it. The daring thing to do was to sit outside and look down with superiority on the little boys who ran alongside at each stop, turning cartwheels for money and shouting, Hey, penny a penny -o! Hey, penny a penny -o! But I was the lucky boy. I was escaping from town. I was going to the Mumbles, where there was actually a pier. At the land end, a concert party under glass roofs and slot machines all along over the sea selling already melted chocolate in summer, and footballers kicking marbles you could work for a penny. A pier where men with permanent colds fished and continually hauled in crabs. And beyond the bright waters of Swansea Bay and the Guardian Lighthouse lay a magic land that I hadn't yet seen, Gower. And they told me, if you get a scholarship, you can have a bike. And with a bike, Gower was mine. Well, of course, I didn't discover everything about Gower straight away, but I think I realized enough very early on that I'd got a unique paradise right at my very doorstep. A country, a peninsula jutting out into the sea, cut off from the rest of the world, severed by the commons from the Welsh side of Gower. In fact, the Gower inhabitants to call that section the English. And of course, it's one of the few places in the British Isles where the limestone cliffs drop sheer into the sea. 
and the clean golden sands of their feet, what more could you want? And headland after headland of this limestone rock going away, away always to the west. Of course, the clue to the essential character of Gower is that it is a peninsula. It's cut off from the rest of South Wales. It's had the luck to stay by itself. And I think I can show you. I'll try and draw a map on good Gower sand. Out uh, here, starting with Swansea Bay, here are the Gower headlands beginning. Mumbles, round then, Caswell, Pushty Head, on then to Oxwich, Oxwich to Port Einan, Port Einan, then you get that wonderful line of cliffs that ends at Worms Head. Then Rosilli, curve of the bay, up then to the North Point, Whitford Point on the sands, right along the North Shore here, and the Lucker Estuary, sealing it off to the north, Swansea Bay, sealing it off to the south. And there you've got Gower, cut off, charming, a little land entirely by itself. This was the land I thought belonged to me, personally, between the age of five to about 14. Perhaps all Swansea boys tended to feel that we'd a right to these miles of cliffs and gleaming sea. We never stopped to think how strange it was to find all this coastline so near industrial Swansea. All the nearest bays were places of Saturday freedom. Langland, crowded as Mother Ganges on a Saturday afternoon even then. But the superior walked around the corner to Caswell, where the sands enlarged by magic as the tide went down. Then came the bays that in those days seemed to us the farthest points of a weekend expedition, only accessible when we were given those bikes for getting our scholarships to the grammar school. There were strange caves, Mitchin Hole and Bacon Hole, stories of prehistory and mammoth bones. Now the cliffs got higher, the sands were wider. The South Gower coast saves its grander effects for the West, and this Gower we only saw when we went to stay in August on holiday at Port Island. The sea thundered in on Mewslade, where the cliffs take their fiercest plunge into the surf, and on the splendid land's end of Gower. No wonder the old Norsemen, sailing up channel towards it, christened it the Worm, a dragon writhing its way out into the sea. I was ten when I climbed onto it for the first time, and for a child, the worm was the supreme adventure. The blowholes just behind the fierce head of the worm were in action. The monster was snorting defiance against the attacking sea. This western end of Gower is full of mysteries, puzzles still unsolved, and the past history of the area has gaps. There's no real certain documentary evidence of exactly when Gower became English-speaking or where the Gower men came from. And writers like J. Mansell Thomas, whose whole life is wrapped up in Gower history, still puzzle about the greatest Gower mystery of them all, the strange built-up cleft in the cliffs behind Port Einan, Culver Hole. So smugglers, of course, are the obvious suggestion, and the romantic idea is that it was a smuggler's hideout. Now, that is quite feasible, because Port Einan, not far from here, was no doubt uh, a headquarters of smuggling at the time when it was a small seaport. Another idea is that the name Culver, being the Anglo-Saxon word for pigeon, indicates that it was a, a kind of a pigeon house, which used by castles or by mansions for breeding pigeons for food, uh, quite a feature of even the castles of Gower. As you see above, the pigeon holes, which are natural ones, are simulators that were in the masonry. And there, are, there is documentary evidence about a, a John Lucas, notorious smuggler and pirate, wrecker of French ships and so on, who made all this headland at one time inaccessible and used this as an armory. That was about 200 years ago. And there is, in the document, reference to a Culvert Hall, which is almost certainly Culver Hall, linked with his own salt house around the corner by an underground passage. His house was facing east, and of course, a view down the channel here was very valuable for him. Of course, all this is speculation, and no one has really made any serious research into this. 
But the chances are that it was, in fact, used for all these three things, for by smugglers, uh, for pigeon breeding, and as a, a fortress or stronghold. And very likely they were used for all these three, all at the same time. The stones of Culver Hole are old, but on the cliff tops are things far older, the earthworks. Bronze Age, anti-Roman, what were they? One thing's certain, their builders were on the defensive, backs to the sea. Gow has always been defending itself, the castles against the Welsh. Oystermouth, the stronghold of the de Breuses, perhaps today it needs defence itself against the speculative builder. Webley, on the north side, where the border ran with the Welsh. Oxwich, in the woodlands above the curving bay, half castle, half manor house. Pen Rice, the most impressive of them after Oystermouth. The Gower Show was held here, our chance to sneak away from our elders and ice cream in hand, explore its forbidden towers. Lonely Pennard, overlooking the sand dunes and the cliffs. From the distance, perfect. Close to, we were disappointed to find a shell with no history. Gower men had taken this land by the sword in the mists of the 12th century. And when I was young, they seemed determined to cling to it at all costs. Gower in those days was a closed society, as concentrated as these narrow strips on the headland out to the worm. They seemed to go back in shape, at any rate, to the old medieval three-field system. And I used to listen to the farmers talking below when I lay half asleep upstairs in the old farmhouse in which our family holidayed. They talked of the sheep, there's rich feeding along the headlands, and ploughing. The old Gower farmer was a real individual. He knew how to get the last penny out of the last inch of his land. But Mr George Tucker tells me the old life is all gone now. Oh, yes, things have changed in all shapes and forms. And, of course, whereas it used to be in your day, tenant farmers, in these days, of course, the farmers are all freeholders, and that gives them a different outlook in life because they haven't got to bother about anybody else. And, of course, it has changed in as much as most of the Gower people themselves have had to go away to get a living, and the houses and the cottages being bought up by those people who got the most money. Consequently, the economic side of it makes a difference to the people who are living in the villages. It does seem a pity, but I suppose we've got to accept it. Still, you remember the old characters and the stories about them. And uh, tell us a story in the Gower dialect. There's the story of Will Benham of Norton. He took Elsie, sent his son Martin up to Renison for a bottle of medicine, and when I brought it back, Martin said, and yet his for the father take it. He took it and said, I can't drink that boy, I can't abide it. And so I said to Martin, well, they drink it. I can't drink it either, Father. I said, what? I said, Custom, they drink it either. Well, give it to the mother, and then she'd drink anything rather than waste it. <laughs> yes. That's the sort of people like we used to have, but they're all gone. Gower was largely a pony and trap society when I first saw it before the First World War. Some of the old folk Mr Tucker remembers were still there. The cockle woman of Pencloud in the north, going out over the vast flat sands of the Lucher estuary, balancing wooden pails on their heads, and selling the cockles in Swansea Market every Saturday. Cockles and crabs and lobsters. You get them still today from the coast. Jack Bynan is 80. Lobsters and crabs still come to the same places that his grandfather showed him, among the limestone that the sea carves into surrealist shapes.
Those rock pools held treasures. I used to fish up shrimps and sea anemones, but the rocks themselves gave us a richer treasure, the lava weed, the only seaweed you can eat, we used to boast. You had to know where to look for it, and the best of it only grows on limestone, and I'd better not tell you where. And 50 years later, here am I, finally learning the secrets of making lava bread as I sit in the kitchen with Mrs. Taylor at Horton. I bring it up and I soak it to get all the sand up. First here. After that, I have to wash it at least two or three times. First water. So, second water. And then I uh, put it in a saucepan to steam it. And I steam it for at least four or five hours. I put just a little water in the bottom, not for it to stick. And then it just goes happily along and I forget all about it until it's ready. Mind you, I've got to add salt. I did a little this morning. And this is done. But after that, I have to put it to a mincer. Or you can chop it just how you like, but we like it minced. After that, you just fight with plenty of bacon and there's your lot. I've always felt it was as good as caviar. Once you acquire the taste, of course. Yes. And it's nearly as precious. <laughs> <laughs> we put a little old finger on that. So as this weed grows only in certain places. Uh, I remember when I was a little boy, Slade was the great place to pick it. Oh, I picked a lot in Slade, but this year we had a wonderful lot in Horton Bay. Is it as popular now as when I was a little boy? Who do people eat it now? I don't know, the old villagers. When did you learn to make it, Stella? Uh, oh, my mother told me when I was a very, very young child. So this is the real traditional recipe, handed down from mother to daughter. Oh, yes. Oh, I did it in the First World War. And I sort of always done it since. I think our lava bed is now almost ready to eat the eaten. It looks perfect, Mrs. Taylor. But uh, one thing, we must have some bacon with lava bread. I've got it all ready, Mr. Thomas. Ah, now that really looks as it should be. Bacon. The uninitiated may shudder and say it looks like cold tar, but I became a connoisseur of lava bread in Gower, and my verdict on Mrs. Taylor's lava bread was... Oh, perfect. Lava bread, the taste of the sea. Yet a strange thing on the whole, the Gower man isn't a seafarer. Still, when I was a boy, I used to watch the lifeboat practice with a Janet at Port Island. A very much younger Mr. Taylor was actually in the crew then. Meeting him again, I asked, why a lifeboat at Port Island? Well, we had a lifeboat because uh, we had a couple of very bad wrecks before we had a lifeboat. Mm. And that decided the point. But uh, we used to have two practices every year. Eight horses to drag it out. I used to admire them very much because the courage they had to face those mountainous waves in the winter, nobody would believe unless they actually saw, the, saw them going through their practices. But in the practice you went right up to your neck. Oh, yes, they did, until the horse began to swim and that was enough water for us to, to launch the lifeboat. But there came a moment, wasn't it 1916? when the Janet never came back. That is correct. It was on uh, the first day, it was on a Saturday morning, I shall never forget. We had to bring the, the life put from the life put house round right here to this very spot at Horton. Because but why did you bring around all this distance? Well, we had to, it was such a terrific gale. It was blowing a real southeast, as we call it. The whole sea was mountainous and we couldn't launch her by the life put house. And after she went off the carriage, I shall never forget, we didn't see no more the life put. And this was at 9 o'clock on Saturday morning. She had to go up to a, a wreck of Pulp D. And when she went up, the skipper, Billy Gibbs, dropped anchor, and the anchor failed to catch. He swung around into the gale, and as he swung the flight foot round, off snapped the mast, and over she goes. And when they got all of them together, there was one missing. A few moments after, she went over again. And this time, they lost the skipper and the second coxswain. Eventually, they struggled back, and they drifted all Saturday evening, Saturday night, and she picked up off numbers sometime early on Sunday morning. And Billy Gibbs never came back? Never came back. 
The statue of Billy Gibbs is the centre of Port Aynan. Port Aynan was my holiday village, the place that seemed to me to symbolise old Gower. Thatch cottages, whitewashed walls, snug, cut off from the world. They talked of the rest of Wales as over there in the Welshery. After August, it went to sleep for a year. I wonder what happens now. I remember we used to go for walks out of Port Island, climbing up that steep hill, and we could hear the wind singing softly in the telegraph wires. And we even, my brothers and I, used to lie down in the middle of the empty road and put our ears to the ground to hear the old Gower buses changing gear two miles away. And the clip-clop of horses' hooves when we went riding in the little pony and trap, which was the great way of taking trips in those days. I still can't hear horses' hooves on stony ground without straight away coming back in my mind the great trip we took out of Fort Einan to Llangeneth. Well, it was all the distance of about, must be ten miles, it was an expedition. Llangeneth, even more remote, tucked away, even more westerly at the far end of Gar than Port Einan itself. And I don't think Llangeneth has changed very much in all the years that have passed since then. Wherever I've been, oh, Langeneth for me, Langeneth for me, the charm of the country, so lovely and free. Walter, you're Phil Tanner's nephew, Phil who made Gower folk song famous. And I used to hear him singing here in the King's Head, and I think Brindley and George would agree, your uncle was Gower's greatest folk singer. Well, there's a couple in the family that has a good, clear voice, clear singing, something like a bell. But I think a lot of it came from his father. He was a noted singer, local singer, all Isaac Tanner's name was. Okay? If you were a singer in those days, there were quite a lot of perks attached to it. There was the bid-in weddings, where... The the singer used to go to all the houses and bid the guests to come, and everywhere he went, he had as more than he could cope with to drink. He had to have a capacity, too. And he had it, believe me. <laughs> How come such a man that had an eye for such so many shapely maids never got married, to my knowledge? Well, yeah, you, you, you were knowledge is wrong in this case. You well, I, I mean, I'm 30 years, 40 years younger than right, Phil Tanner, right, I mean, right, but yes, to yes. my knowledge, he, he never married in my well, time. He married and. An old lady, the landlord of the welcome to town at the, the public in the, in the village, the other last one that's closed down here, really. He married the landlady of that. John Thomas's widow? No, dear, no. John Thomas's mother's widow. Oh, He's going back a bit. Thomas's mother. <laughs> well, she was a shapely woman, I'm sure. Oh, sure. She must be attractive because Phil, Phil liked uh, everything. Played on. <laughs> Everything with was delight and charm. Hmm? Do you remember any of his songs at all? Can well, you sing us one before we... Oh, well, I'm, I'm afraid I can't sing much of his songs today. I think it would be competing with him yes, and it look hopeless. Last two. <laughs> try the last two verses of your song and we'll join in at the end. Well, the second verse, the third verse is a little bit is perhaps historical now, but I think I'll sing it anyway, you see that. Uh, I, I mourn the old welcome, the welcome to town, that pious hierarchy decreed to close down. Its glories has faded, its grandeur has been, while golden king's head gaily stalks over the sea. <laughs> but the king's head to me is still Phil Tanner. When I was a boy, he seemed the very spirit of old Gower. Towards there on the banks of the sweet primroses that I beheld a most pleasant maid. Phil may have gone, but many of the glories of his gower remain. The silly sands still haven't been overwhelmed. They, and much more, are devoutly defended by the gower society against the spoiler. 
The worm remains as I remember it. But the swarms of new visitors can't destroy its strange, impressive power. The worm. We camped out on it as a last adventure when I was 14, and as we cycled home to Swansea, we came up over Kevin Bryn, the moorland that runs down the centre, the backbone of Gower. On top of the bracken-covered ride, the grey, ponderous bulk of Arthur's stone. A gigantic ruined Cromlech, balanced by a miracle on small stones. They said he came down to drink in the Lacher River on midsummer night, and from it I looked north. On the horizon, a line of wide mountains, the Carmarthenshire Vans, far wilder than compact little Gower. And I knew then that here was the next bit of Wales I had to challenge and explore. <laughs>